You know, we really do trust in, in a lot of things, and that's good. Um, we trust in our family. Uh, we trust in the people around us. Um, we have trust in our job. Uh, we trust our money's going to hold out. But this morning, I want us to think about our ultimate trust. Where is your ultimate trust this morning? In what or in whom are you placing your trust for life? And I think that's always a challenge. For almost 10 years, Dixie and I worked in uh, children's homes. Mostly it was kids from uh, dysfunctional families. Um, some of them had gotten in trouble, some had not. Some were great kids. They just got booted out of their home. And we worked with these kids. And it was always fascinating because a lot of those kids trusted no one. Everybody in their life that they had trusted had let them down. So why should I let you into my life? Because if I trust you, you're just going to let me down again. We found that they would automatically come into the children's home and reject themselves because that was a way of life. That was their security. They put up a wall. If you work with people, you know what I'm talking about. And I found that it took me, when I went into uh, one home in North Carolina and one up in Elizabethtown, it took us about a year for a young person to trust me. And I remember I was laying in bed last night, and, and I thought about this thing about three weeks. Whew. I was laying in bed last night, and I remembered a little kid named Monty Santiago. Montana Ortez Santiago. And we moved from North Carolina to Kentucky, and I remember the little kid wiping tears out of his eyes and waving goodbye. And I felt terrible. I knew I was in God's will for my life. <clears throat> but trust is an interesting concept. And um, for, for many of these kids, they didn't trust anybody. Everybody let them down. So why should they trust God? God's going to let me down eventually was their mindset. And um, I'm always drawn back to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, which I love dearly. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy paths. And, you know, I've, I've quoted that many times. I've used that many times. I go back to it myself many times because I find comfort and strength. But I don't think I've ever taken it and broken it down piece by piece. So you're the guinea pigs this morning. Hang with me. I want to go forth through it just piece by piece. And I don't think I've ever heard a message preached on it. And I wanted to hear one, so I decided that's what we'd preach on. on. Besides my prayer time. Um, Proverbs 3 begins with principles of right living. And, and then it talks about practical guidance and what it means to walk with God. Verses 1 through 4 are, are rooted in sound teaching. Sound teaching of following who God's called us to be. 5 and 6 talked about that trust relationship. How you and I need to trust God implicitly, completely, at all times. And then he talks about the rewards of those who obey. We looked at 5 and 6. Look back with me at uh, uh, chapter 3 and verse 1. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart. As I thought about that in preparation, keep your commands in my heart. I'm big on Sunday school, and I'm big on the Bible school concept, which is a lot of what we do on Wednesday nights. And, and I thought back to, to my times as a child at, in, my, in North Minister Baptist Church, and I remember Psalm 119. Thy word is a lamp unto thy feet and a light unto thy paths. And I will hide thy words in my heart that I might not sin against God. God has called us to make his word a part of our life. And if we do, when those tough times come, I know I can trust God at his word. And I know where to, I, I'm not a scholar, but I know where to go back to because it's a part of who I am. And I, I'm going to come back to parents in a few minutes. I'm so thankful my parents made sure little Haywood was in Sunday school and church and Bible school because they knew God's word was going to be proclaimed. He said, let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. In other words, love and faithfulness become a part of who we are. It's how we function. You talked about loving completely a moment ago, Beth, and that's what God calls us to do. Not superficially like the world teaches us, like the, the media would portray, but to love completely and to bind them around our neck. Make it a part of who we are. Then you will find favor and a good name in the sight of God. God provides a reward for those who trust him completely. I'm confident of that. 
Then 5 and 6, we, we read a moment ago, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. All thy ways acknowledge him. I think it says he will make your path straight. I like King James, he will direct your paths. And then I like that beginning of verse 7. Don't forget this. Don't forget the beginning of verse 7. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Many times we stumble. We trust God, but when crunch time comes, we go back to what we think is best and what we know best, what we think is best. And as I studied this scripture the last three, believe it or not, about three or four weeks, that's how slow I am, I, I, you know, I, I, I kept realizing that God's word is a tapestry. Think about that. You know, you turn it over in the back and there are all those loose strings for you sewers and weavers. There's all those loose strings. When you turn it over on the front, it makes sense. And as I went through particularly Proverbs and Psalms, everywhere I turned, everywhere I turned, there was this tapestry of seek wisdom, seek truth, seek God's love. A couple of weeks ago on a Friday morning during my quiet time, I'm thinking about my sermon. And I turn up, or God's sermon I maybe, Psalms chapter 25 pops up. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust. In you I trust, O God. Show me your ways. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. God was hitting me right between the faith, between the eyes. This last Friday was my quiet time. It was in the morning before I get going. Psalm chapter 37, verses 3 and 5. Trust in the Lord and do good. I'm hearing you, God. I hear you. There's that tapestry of trust and love. Dwell in the land and enjoy safety and pasture. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. God keeps coming back at me. Keeps coming back at me. This morning I'm sitting in our den going through my quiet time. Proverb, I'm sorry, Psalms chapter 40. Many who will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust. Over and over and over again, God says in his word, trust me. And you know, it's easy to trust God when the good times are coming. It's when the tough times come that it becomes a challenge. And that's why I say, you know, we need to walk with God each day so that we're strong. And when the tough times come, as they are and they will, then we've got our relationship built strongly in the presence of Jesus Christ. The bottom line, the principles of trust and obedience are joy, fulfillment, and peace. You want to find joy in life? You want to find fulfillment in life? You want to find peace in life? The world will teach you that there are a thousand different ways to do that. God's word there says there's one way. Trust me and obey me. Amen. You walk on my path and I'll take care of you. I will show you your will. God never said it would be easy. <laughs> he never said it would be easy. There are going to be tough times. But he did say I'll be there. And I'm going to help you. I'm going to be your strength. I'm going to be your wisdom when you don't understand. But my friend, unless we walk with him through the good times... then we won't know where to go during the tough times. God said, trust me, trust me. So, you know, without trust, trust is the, is the foundation of any relationship. i got to hear an amen. amen. Trust is the foundation of any relationship. Without trust, without trust, any relationship is weak and perhaps non-existent at all. Perhaps there's no, no relationship without trust. We must trust one another and trust God in order to find his purpose in life. You know, we're told to trust God. So what is trust? Faith. Trust is faith. Trust, trust is confidence. Trust is belief in someone or something. You know, I think sometimes we think we have to understand it all to trust God. And I think sometimes people think, well, you know, the preacher understands it all. No, they don't. They don't understand it all. God understands it all. We don't, if we understood everything there was to know about God, we wouldn't need God. Amen? We sat over in a Bible study. It's been a couple years ago, and one of our young men was going through a tremendous challenge in his life. And, and that thought just hit me so strong. 
If we understood everything, we wouldn't need God. And I, I trust in things I don't understand. I mean, I, I thought about this the last couple of weeks. Um, about five years ago, we flew over to Poland. We flew into Berlin, Germany. And I thought eight hours over top of the water in some machine that weighs gazillion tons and some man's driving the controls I've never met. But I trust the guy. I don't understand how planes fly, but they do. And God says, you don't have to understand everything. Trust me. Trust me. And I'm well aware that people will let you down and they will let me down. God says we need to trust him completely and totally in all that we do. Um, trusting in God means simply this. Believing that he is going to do exactly what he said he was going to do. Trusting in God means he's going to do everything that he said he was going to do. That he's going to keep every one of his promises and that he's going to be there to see us through. That's what trusting in God is all about. It's believing him, even when we don't understand. God, why, why, why do I have to go through this? I can't give you that answer, but God will. And I'm going to come back to that in just a couple minutes. Um, what keeps people from trusting God? Sometimes it's their past. Sometimes it's like those children I talked about. Everybody in life had failed them. I think one thing that keeps us from trusting God, for many of us, is simply this. We don't really take time to get to know God. We say we do. Oh, I've made a commitment. I, I've been baptized. I even go to church at least once a week. But we really don't walk with God. And the reason we don't trust him is because we don't know him. And it takes time. I have to invest time. And the more time I invest, the more completely I understand his will for my life. And the times in my life when I've tried to go out and, and do it in my own wisdom, I've always flopped. I've always flopped. It just doesn't work. We think we know what's best sometimes, and we're too busy. We're really too busy to get to know God. I mean, we just don't have time. But we have time to do the things that we really want to do. And I've learned this. As long as my trust is in anything other than Jesus Christ, I'm headed for a time of uncertainty. Amen. As long as I'm trusting my life with anything other than Christ, then there's a time of uncertainty. It's always interesting for me as I travel, I, 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 talk, I have trouble talking to people. I know it's hard to understand. Actually, I could probably talk to a tree if I thought it would listen. We were in North, outside of Charlotte, North Carolina about three weeks ago, and I was talking to, we went to a children's museum, um, an interactive museum. They had a fire truck and a, a boat and a grocery store. It was kind of neat. It was interesting. I looked around, and all of a sudden I realized I was the oldest person in the building, <laughs> That was always a, an interesting thought. Started talking to one of the guys working there, and, and we, we, a little while he said, you know, I've gotten back into church. I've gotten back into church, and things are going so much better. People always want to throw me that line. Oh, so you're a pastor? They want to know what you're doing. I'm in church. And I always come back with the same thing, you know. But the key is knowing Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. Church is important. Church is important. Church is the icing on the cake, but the cake is knowing Jesus. We were out to, uh, after the Pedro's Mall the other night after dinner and just walking around stretching a little bit and saw a gentleman that used to go to church here and they all of a sudden start to apologize. Well, you know, I don't go to Elkhorn anymore. No, actually, I didn't know that, but uh, I don't go anymore. So he told me where he was going. He always kind of diffused the situation. I said, listen, as long as you're going somewhere that preaches Jesus and lives by the Bible, amen, brother. Amen. You go where you're comfortable worshiping. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm here because I choose to be at Elkhorn. But the key is knowing Jesus. People always try to diffuse that relationship. Jeremiah 29 13 says, You will seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. That tapestry of trust. When you and I really search for God with the depths of our being, we'll find God. We'll find his presence. We'll walk with him completely. And then he says in verse 5, trust in the Lord. You know, we can trust in a lot of things, but ultimately our salvation, our eternal destiny is determined in the Lord, right. in Jesus Christ, and our, our involving him in our life, inviting him into our heart and living for him. 
I love that phrase in verse 5. <clears throat> trust in him with all your heart. How are we called to trust in him? Totally and completely. Totally and completely. I would ask you this morning to look into the mirror of your spiritual life. Am I trusting Jesus Christ totally and completely, even when I don't understand, through the tough times and through the, the, the good times? Am I trusting him completely? As I look through Proverbs and Psalms, I'm, I'm well aware that love and trust go hand in hand. They're really kind of a synonymous duo. Loving God and trusting God is so very important. None of us, none of us wants to be in a relationship that has half-hearted love and half-hearted trust. Do you? I don't. I don't want half-hearted love and, and half-hearted trust. I'd rather somebody say to you, hey, you know, you're an okay guy, but I really don't like you and I don't want to mess with you. That's fine. But don't tell me you love me and trust me if you don't. We want to be somewhere where we're trusted completely. That's why Deuteronomy and Matthew both simply say this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Now, I know the heart is a muscle, but it, it represents who we are, our person. Trust in the Lord with all our heart, with all our soul, our existence, our mind, our body, and our strength. In other words, God says clearly, trust in me with the total fiber of your being. Trust in me with all that you are. Don't trust in me in just part of your area of your life. I'm not interested in being a part of your life. I'm interested in being your complete life. Any more than you and I want someone in this life to trust us partially. We want total completement in our relationship with God. That's the way God wants us to trust him. And God's Holy Spirit becomes a divine compass. A divine compass that shows us his direction and his will for our, for our lives. Always there, ready to lead us in the right direction. As I said a moment ago, God's not interested in half-hearted commitment. You're not interested in your family. If you're in a business, you're not interested in, in people that you work with that are half-heartedly committed to you. Some of you are involved in a profession where your very life, your very life might depend on somebody else doing their job. You want somebody you can trust, somebody you can depend on. Some of you are on an athletic team or you're in a marching band. You're part of a group. You trust each other because we depend on each other. And God says, I want that, I want that total commitment. I want that total trust. Now, most of us in here, if, if we're adults, anyway, we've been through a surgery or two. You remember that feeling about being on the bed and they, they roll you down the hall and you know there's a guy down there with the big hammer they call an anesthesiologist? And you know there's a doctor with a little instrument, a knife they call a scalpel? I trusted those people. I don't want somebody messing with me that I don't trust. People say, aren't you worried? No, I'm not. I'm in God's hand. These people care about me, and I trust these people. Friend, God wants us to trust him totally and completely. We get in a jam when we only trust him partially, and that's, that can be a problem for us. Verse five, in, in, in verse 5 again, he says, Aaron, you with me? Lean not onto your own understanding. Now, here's where some of us get into a problem. Lean not on your own understanding. To lean on our own understanding seems simple. It's a warning. It's simply this. Don't depend on yourself. Don't depend on your own wisdom. You know, did God give us judgment? Yes. Did God give us the ability to make decisions? Yes. But God also told us to walk with him before we make those decisions, before we make those judgments. And if you and I are walking in the presence of God, we have a much better chance of walking in his will. Amen? When we walk out of his will, we're in trouble. The problem is, too often, we think we know what's best for us. We think we've got it all figured out. Maybe I'm different from everybody else in this room. But there are times when I think, I've got it figured out. And that's when it always seems to mess up. When we depend on ourselves, when we trust in our judgment, we, we find out that the worldly ways will never satisfy. The world says it's all about me. It's all about what I want. It's all about meeting my needs. It's all about getting things done in my time. And God says, slow down. 
and let me be, let me be in charge. God simply wants us to depend on him totally and completely, not ourselves. You know, giving up control sometimes is tough. And most of us have been in a situation where, where we didn't have any control. So like I said, when, they, when I got wheeled down the hall for surgery, my control was gone. I had already been given the goofy medicine. I didn't know where I was anyway. Somebody else was in control. God wants us to realize that he's in control and to acknowledge him in, in, in everything that we do, to depend on him. You know, following our own understanding is somewhat like Samson in the Old Testament. Remember Samson? Samson thought he could do everything in his own strength. And he trusted in Delilah. Probably was nothing wrong with trusting in her, except he didn't know much about her, and she wasn't a person he could trust. You know, we trust in people. People, people are sometimes going to help us and sometimes let us down. But he trusted in the wrong person. And what's interesting in, in Judges chapter 16, verse 19, it says this, His strength left him. His strength left him. But probably, maybe, think about this now, maybe the saddest verse in the Bible, maybe the saddest verse in the whole book is Judges 16, verse 20. He, Samson, did not know that the Lord had left him. And I'm here to tell you this morning, sometimes you and I get so distracted, we get so busy, we get so fired up about stuff and the events and activities of this world, and they may not be bad. You know, I'm a sports guy. Sports are not bad. You know, some of you are, are car people, cars, whatever your thing is, hunting, whatever your thing is, it's not bad. But when it becomes so important and we're so distracted that we separate ourselves from God and we really don't realize that we're no longer walking with God, we're in trouble. Samson didn't even know God had, had left him. Too often our problem is we leave God. God doesn't leave us. We leave God. Samson was self-dependent. He trusted himself. He lost his direct, listen to me now, when he stopped trusting completely in God, he lost his direction, he lost his purpose, and ultimately he lost his life. Because he stopped trusting totally in God. How about you this morning? Are you trusting totally in God in all that you do? I don't know why we try to do things on our own. I guess we're just hard-headed. Some of us are, right, Dixie? Some of us are pretty hard-headed. <laughs> Jeremiah 33 says, Call to me and I will answer you, and I'll show you great and mighty things that you haven't known. Call unto me. I'm right here. All you got to do is call. All you got to do is seek. You'll find it. What's wrong? Call unto me. I'll show you great and mighty things which you don't know. In Romans eleven thirty three, 33. Oh, the depths of the wisdom and knowledge of God. We can know the mind of Christ. God's depths of wisdom are so enormous. You and I can't comprehend what he wants to teach us. But my friend, we have to take the time to seek his face. If we don't, We'll never find it. In Isaiah 55, my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways. No, because God's are higher than ours. Praise the Lord. And he wants us to seek those ways. He wants us to know him completely. And you and I have to trust him and we have to follow him. Where do we get our wisdom? Where do we develop our trust? I honestly believe the most important area of your Christian life and my Christian life is my daily walk with Christ. I wouldn't ask you to raise your hand for a minute. But I would ask this question. How many of us take time to read God's word every day? How many of us take time? I got two hands. You don't have to wait. How many of us take time to pray every day? How many of us take time to seek God's will every day? How many of us take time to live in that will? How many of us live our life as an act of worship? Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. How many of us live our lives as a living witness for Christ in all that we do? The reason a lot of us don't trust God completely is because we don't walk with God completely. And God's called us to do that. When people come up, as I said a moment ago, well, I've missed church or I've gone, 
I'm not worried about all that. I want to know about your walk. I want to know about your walk. What's your daily walk like? One of the young people told me, I've used this before, told me a while back, well, I just don't have time during my day to walk with God. Did you eat yesterday? Yes. Did you eat every day last week? Yes. How many times? About three. Well, we have time to do what we want to do. And I have to, I'm just telling you, this old boy has to set his alarm and discipline myself to walk with God. I challenge you, if you don't remember anything else, walking with God, to, at least in my mind, is the key to trust Him in God. God always knows what's best. And when He says, don't lean on your understanding, it's not a joke. It's the truth. And the way that I know God's will is I get into His Word and I pray. And that's leaning not on my own understanding. And then he says in verse 6, In all your ways acknowledge him. Now that's big. You say, well, I've read this thing a thousand times. So have I. But it really hit me the last three weeks. It takes me three weeks to get ready. Acknowledge him in all your ways. Do we really do this or do we think we know what's best? What does it mean to acknowledge him? Well, it means several things. It means we have to submit to him. It means we have to commit our lives to him. It means we have to be faithful to him. It means we need to be uh, loyal to him. And it means we need to depend on him in all that we do. In all your ways, acknowledge him. We acknowledge him when we recognize his presence. When you get up in the morning and you go to school, or you go to work, or you go about your daily task. Depending on, acknowledging him means depending on him and recognizing his presence in all that we do. That's why he tells us in the word, to be still and know that I'm God. Most of us, you know, I'm like you. I come in, we cut the TV or the radio on, we cut something on. We got to have some kind of noise going on. There's always something going on in my house, you know. Be, but God says, be still and know that I'm God. He wants us to know that he's given us the gift of life in Christ. He wants us to know that he's got a purpose for us on this earth. And sometimes I think we do a poor job, forgive me, we do a poor job of communicating that to our young people. God's got his hand on you. I told two young ladies a moment ago, I'm so blessed that they are here. I'm inspired by these two young ladies. God's got a purpose. Let's help each other as adults, as young people, as children, find that purpose. Why do we acknowledge him? Because he has a home prepared for us in heaven. We need to understand that our salvation is through our relationship with Jesus Christ. He's always there ready to fellowship with us. He's always ready there to guide us. And he's always ready there to walk with us. And his call is to follow him daily. To follow him daily. Sometimes I'll call home and tell Dixie, how you doing? I just, just want to say, how you doing? Just checking, say, how you doing? Or she'll call back. You know, if you have friends like that, I, my best friend is here today, Eric. I love you, man. And I'll call. We, we talk usually twice every night. Dixie says we're like two little schoolgirls. You know, what are you wearing tomorrow? What are you wearing tomorrow? What time are you going to be there? I love Eric Graves. Eric would die for me. I love him dearly. We, we spend time. We communicate with people that we love, people that we trust. And he wants us to worship him with a pure heart. He wants us to make his word and his will known to others. But let me tell you this. For me, acknowledging God and trusting God are a daily decision. Let me say that again. Acknowledging God and trusting God are a daily decision. Now, I was saved in October of 1959. Do the math. It's been a while. But that didn't, that set my salvation for life. But it didn't set my walk for life. It's a daily choice. And I have to choose today, God, help me to live my life in such a way that others would see Jesus and bring glory. I got cold chills. And bring glory and honor to you in heaven. That's my prayer each morning. God, help me to live in such a way that others would see Christ in my life. I can't tell you how to pray or what to pray. I can only tell you that God wants us to acknowledge him. You know, we think we know what's best.
But too often, we want to give God selective control. I want you to think about this now. We want to give God selective control of our lives. I have a friend that called me a couple years ago. Young people, hang with me here now. He called me and um, he said, you know, I'm in a relationship with this girl and, and I love her dearly. And they were at totally opposite ends of the spectrum spiritually. He was a Christian and her commitment, according to him. But he said, I love her. I love her. I want to marry her. I didn't tell him what to do. I did share with him, you know, trying to find God's right person and all that. He had already told me he was living with her. So, you know, I wanted to confront him. I'm the duh question. Well, are you sleeping together? Duh. And so, you know, he, uh, he said, um, but, but I'm going to marry her anyway. I'm going to marry her anyway. Selective control. Seeking God's wisdom. Trusting God's judgment. He did. A beautiful little baby was conceived and born. Not long after that, a couple years later, he called me back and he said, she's left me. I miss my baby terribly. And then he said this. Just stay with me here now. Why did God do this to me? Now, I didn't hit him in the head with a King James. I didn't chastise him. I didn't criticize him. I didn't make fun of him. I didn't preach at him. But I did say, son, remember when we talked a while back? You have made some choices that were not in God's will. And what's happened now is a result of those choices. I wanted him to understand that. I love this young man. I wish him the best. I will help him. I will do anything I can to help him. But friend, when we have selective control in our lives and we choose willfully to be out of God's will, we can't expect God to bless our lives. It just doesn't happen. Yep. God, God is interested in every area of our life. Every area of our life. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I've got a story to tell. I'll hold that one. And in um, Colossians 3.17, he says, whatever you do, go to school, go to work, in your home, in your community, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Sometimes I wonder if we just don't understand what everything means. 1 Corinthians 10.31, he says, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. I'm here to tell you this morning, God's word can be complicated but if we'll seek his will, it becomes simple. He says, whatever you do, live for me. Don't give me selective control. Give me all total control. Seek my will every day. Walk with me, and I'll show you the path of life. But you got to trust me. you got to trust me. And that's what he says. That's what he says to us in his word. We get into a problem when we go our own way. If you're a parent in here today, let me say to you, don't think for a minute that your children are not looking at your life because they're watching. Is mom and dad or whoever or whomever I live with, are they giving God glory in every area of their lives? Are they seeking God's will in every area of their lives? And God wants every area of your life. He's not selfish. He's not selfish. It's like that parent that tries to get their child in God's will in obedience. They're not selfish. They know what's best for their child. God knows what's best for his children, and he asks us to walk with him. And then he says in verse 6, he will make our path straight. Or the King James says, he will, he will direct our path. You know, as I, as I thought about this the last couple of weeks, that's a good thought. But it's more than that. It's a promise. Amen. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he, what? will make your path straight. He will direct your path. That's a promise. That's a promise that God himself made to us in his word. A promise of holiness to accomplish his purpose. He's there to guide us. He's there for us. He'll never leave us or forsake us. I love those words in Hebrews 13. I'll never leave you or forsake you. And I've learned in my life there are times when I've left him, I've strayed the path. He reached down and grabbed my arm, but my hand let go, and he didn't let go. 
He's right there. I'll never leave you. Just trust me. Just trust me. And that's God's promise for us. He never said it would be easy. Golly, he never said it would be easy. But he did say he'd be there to guide us. Sometimes the path is narrow. Sometimes the path is tough. But he's there ready to lead us. And the Bible says the way is broad that leads to destruction. It's easy to mess our life up. Just don't follow God. Just do whatever we want. It's tough to walk in God's will. But I promise you, not because I'm so smart, but because of God's word, the benefits of walking with him are not only wonderful in this life, they're eternal and we can be blessed. Psalm 16, I, I love, and, and Acts 2 actually says, He will make known to us the path of life. I'm trusting God to do that. And you know, most all of us in life are at some crossroads. If we're a young person and, and we're a teenager, there are crossroads ahead in the next 10 years. In the ages 15 to 25, there'll be more changes in your life than at any other time in your life. I promise you. Ages, ages 15 to 25. You're going to graduate from high school. You're going to decide what you want to do with your life. Some of you are going to go to college. Some of you are going to be married. Some of you are going to be parents. Those changes are big. But I'm also learning as I get older, there are changes in my life too. You know? There are changes in my life too. Had a birthday two weeks ago. I'm, I'm soberly aware that the changes are coming. And I have to be responsible to make good changes. But he said he would be there to help him if he would trust him. Jeremiah 29, 11, God says he has a plan. God has a plan for every one of us. But you and I have a choice. We can choose to follow that plan, trust him, walk with him, or we can choose to go in our own way. It's really up to you. But I know that God wants to show us his will for our lives. <clears throat> I'm not a real complicated guy. I know that's hard to understand. I know he understands it. <clears throat> when I go somewhere, I still like to use one of these things. You know, if I'm going to see my family in, in Virginia, there's five or six different ways that I can get there. Some of them are, are good, and some of them are short, and some of them are crooked as a snake, and it takes forever. But I have a choice. I can use the map. But there are a lot of different ways to get to the same place, and they all change. A couple years ago for Christmas, our, our, um, our kids gave us a GPS. They're really neat. I've had fun. I, I can't figure out how that little lady gets in the box and talks, though, but it's fun. We have a good time. My daughter and her family were coming back from Bowling Green to our house a few weeks ago, and they know where we live. They know how to get there, but they, they plugged us in, and, and I know you can come through Hart County. There are five or six ways from Bowling Green to Campbellsville, but they ended up on some one-and-a-half lane pig path in Hart County, but it was the shortest way geographically. So I, I, I enjoy these, it's fun, but it's not always foolproof for this boy. The map sometimes does not, do you have one of those, Mark? Do you all have one of those? But they do, they don't always take you the right way. But you know, it's interesting. When I think about a compass, when I think about a compass, when I turn this puppy around, north is always north, south is always south, East is always east, and west is always west. It's never going to change. God says, I want your, my Holy Spirit to be your compass. And I, I don't rely on those things. I don't, know, don't use a compass much. But I do rely on the divine presence of my Heavenly Father to be my divine compass and to guide me in His will. Even though God's ready to direct our paths, we have to choose. Because knowing and obeying are two different things. Now think about that. I go back to the story of the young man that I talked to a couple years ago. Knowing God's will and being obedient to God's will are two different things. Because we really may not want to do what he asked us to do. But sometimes it causes us to step out on faith. And that's the trust. God always has the big picture. He always knows what's ahead. He knows what's coming. The problem with most of us is in trust, we want to know what's going to happen tomorrow. I do. I want to know what's going to happen next week. I'm thinking about some financial planning. I want to know what's going to happen on December 31st, January the 1st. 
I want to know what's going to happen in a year, five years, ten years. But I tell you what I've learned, God doesn't work that way. And I've told young people for years, and, and my wife had to remind me of what I've told young people. If we will be faithful to God today, he will show us his will for tomorrow. And I'm not talking about necessarily December the 10th. I'm talking about the future. We will be faithful. God's not going to show us everything. That's not for us to know. It would drive us crazy if we knew it was going to happen in five years. But he says, if you'll be faithful today, I'll show you tomorrow. Walk with me today. Son, gal, walk with me today. Trust me. Follow me. And be obedient to me. I'll show you my will for tomorrow. But simply, we miss his blessing too often because we've got it all figured out. We think and we choose to go our own way. While we're waiting, God's working. Waiting is not a bad thing. Patience is a good thing. It's tough sometimes, but God's standing right there to teach us in, in his will. And he wants us to be patient and, and, and to, uh, to trust him, to have faith, to have obedience, and to have patience. I, I, I love Tony Dungy, if you've read any of his stuff. and He's a uh, former coach, former com he's a commentator on, um, on NFL games. One of his comments in his book says this, Sometimes... God takes away what we want. Sometimes God takes away what we want and not willing to give up in order to get us where he wants us to be. Amen. You know, I, I have found that to be so very true in the last five years. If that were not true, I would not be with you this morning. God takes away what we think is so important. God's timing is perfect. Waiting on God? Waiting on God's not wasting time. You know, I, I've told this story before, but I'll tell it again. Young people, stay with me here. I was flying on an airplane to San Antonio, Texas, and a young uh, black man was sitting beside me. Never met the guy in my life. 25 years old. His name was Curtis. And he said, how do you know you've met the right person to marry? It's a big question. I never met the guy in my life. I said, first of all, don't marry the gal that you have to have. That's a mistake. Marry the gal that you can't do without. You can't live your life without. And I said, secondly, marry the person who wants the best for you. Don't marry the person who's selfish, trying to get what they can get out of a relationship. Marry that person who's always seeking to better you and to help you and to strengthen you. You know, God kind of works like that. He's always there ready to, to help us, to wait, to trust. His timing is perfect. You know, I mean, even Jesus, Matthew tells us, he had to get off by himself and pray to seek the Father's will. I mean, if my Lord and Savior and your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, had to get off and pray, how much more do you have to pray? I mean, I'm just little old me. And God, the, the creator of the universe, is there to, to be my guide. When we focus on worldliness and take our focus off Christ, we're going to be disappointed. I, used, I you know, it's like it's like driving a car and going down the road and not following any of the instructions. We're headed for disaster. I've told the young people on a Wednesday night in a Bible study group. You know, I mean, we don't know much about trains anymore because you don't see many of them. Trains are big, they're heavy, they're powerful. We used to live along the railroad track. I'm true story. The railroad, the train track. From my house was about as close as the sanctuary next door. I mean, we were on the tracks. Your house would shake at night. One night the train jumped the track. It didn't go anywhere. But you get that train out in the field, and it's strong, and it's big, and it's powerful out in the field. It's worthless. And I don't care how strong you are, how talented you are, what your abilities are, without the presence of God, without being on his track, without trusting him and obeying him completely, will never find and follow his will. He says, follow me, follow me. I, I love the Psalms. I love Proverbs, Psalm 141. My eyes are fixed on you, Lord. I trust you. I'm headed straight for you. That's God's call for a life. Psalm 32, 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. That's a promise. That's a promise. I'm going to instruct you. I'm going to teach you. 
but you've got to acknowledge me. You've got to walk with me. I share my heart with those that I love most dearly. And God wants to be on that list at the top. And when I share my heart with him, he shares his heart back with me. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. And he will, he will promise, direct your path. But then he's got that warning. Don't forget the warning in verse 7. If you missed that, you've missed it. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Because your wisdom and my wisdom are the exact opposite of trust in God. He knows what's best for us, and he wants to, us to walk with him. Why should we trust God? Number one, he commanded us to. <laughs> Duh, he commanded us to. Number two, he has his promises there for us. He is, number three, he is who he said he is, and he's going to do exactly what he said he'll do. Every promise of his life. Why should we trust him? Because he says if you will invite Jesus Christ into your heart, ask for forgiveness for your sins, make him the personal savior of your life, he's going to walk with you through this earth and show you his will, and he has a home prepared in eternity for you. Amen. John chapter 14, I, 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 go away, I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am there you may be also. I'm trusting God for that. I'm trusting God for that. The last few weeks we've been out with Dixie's dad. He's 90 years old. His, his wife is 91. And, um, you know, he, he says, I'm ready to go. I, I, I'm just ready to go. And, and he's trusting God. He's trusting God to take him on that path to eternity. I like Romans 10, verse 9. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, in other words, if you trust him, if you trust him and confess him, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from dead, you've trusted him with your life, there's the promise. You will be saved. You will be saved. How about you this morning? Have you trusted him completely? Have you invited him into your life as your personal Lord and Savior? And maybe somebody here says, you know, I've thought about it a lot. I just never had the courage to do it. Well, I'll tell you what. Jesus had the courage to be nailed to a cross that you might be forgiven throughout all eternity. He loved you that much. I, I want to challenge you this morning, if you've never done it, if you've never trusted Christ your Savior, have the courage to do that. Have the courage to do that. Or you may say, you know, this morning I, I hear what you're saying and it all sounds good, but, I mean, you don't understand what I'm going through. You're right. And you don't understand what the person next to you is going through either. Are you trusting him enough that every day, young people before you go to school, adults before you go to work or whatever your routine is, that you're trusting him every day? God, show me your way. I'm ready to do it today. When you and I will be faithful, that we'll be blessed beyond all imagination. Jesus commanded us also in, in chapter 14 in verse 1. He said this, trust God, trust also in me. It's pretty simple. John 14, verse 1, trust God, trust also in me. This morning, in what? Or in whom are you trusting your life completely with? That's the question this morning. If we've trusted Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. I remember I mentioned a moment ago the children's home. We had a great run. We had a lot of fun in those years. Those years my kids were very little. Um, I was one of those, I taught swimming. I was one of those dads that before my kids, when they were little babies, before they were a year old, I would push them underwater and let them swim swim through, you know. You may not agree with that, but that's what I did. And we would take our kids to the pool and put them underwater and push them. They loved the water. That's a true story. I'm not, and is that true? Thank you. When you laugh at me, I want to tell the truth. As soon as my kids could walk, they got up on the diving board. And old daddy was out in a 10-foot of water just treading. Come on. And they jumped down. I really didn't want to catch them because that could hurt them. I let them fall in the water, go under. And then I picked them up and pushed them off to the side. And they learned to swim. They learned to swim. But they trusted their father. They, trust, they trusted their daddy. This morning, are you trusting your daddy? I've got cold chills. Are you trusting your daddy? Have you given him your heart and life? Have you given him everything you had? Greg, y'all come on. Have you given him everything you had? This morning, I'm going to ask you, if you've never jumped off the diving board into the arms of your heavenly father, 
He stands waiting as your Lord and Savior for all eternity. Just trust me. Make that decision today. Don't leave here without knowing Christ. Don't leave here without saying, and then with saying, you know, I trusted him, but I'm not really trusting him completely. Today's the day. That's all he asked for. Trust me. Stand with me, would you? We're going to sing together. And I want to encourage you to be responsive to God's call. You may want to come to this altar and, and pray. You may want someone to talk to you. We'll be glad to do that. God, thank you for your love in Christ. Thank you for trusting us. Thank you for trusting us with the gift of life. And I pray that we'll be faithful to accept you as Lord and Savior and to walk with you in all that we do. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Be, be responsive to God's call this morning. Let him speak to your heart. Don't leave without trusting him completely.